Thank you all for joining me today. It's good to be back with all of you. I've invited Dr. Renit Mishori, our Vice President and Chief Public Health Officer, to join me for a conversation on key aspects of the pandemic response here in the United States. Before she joins me, I'd like to provide a sense of our current context here at Georgetown. Regular aspects of campus life have resumed, all of our residential students have returned, and for the past five weeks, classes have been in person. We're holding indoor and outdoor events across our campuses. Our fitness centers have remained open, and last month we returned to in-person dining. We have reestablished campus life as the Omicron surge has waned. In recent weeks, we have seen the Omicron surge recede, both locally and nationally. On our campuses, we saw a peak in cases and positivity in the middle of January. We also experienced a surge in positive cases in the first two weeks of February. While the number of positive cases has started to stabilize and decline on our campuses, at different times over the past two months, we reached more than 100 residential students in isolation. Residential students who test positive are moved to isolation in our on-campus hotel at the Levy Center or at an off-campus hotel, the Glover Park Hotel, just a few blocks from campus. We have not exceeded our isolation capacity in these spaces. In early February, we were able to adjust our isolation guidance according to announcements made by the DC Department of Health. The new DC guidance allowed individuals to test out of isolation after five days under certain conditions. We continue to provide resources for our community on testing. We conduct on average 3,500 tests per week. We have a randomized surveillance testing program for faculty, students, and staff. Members of our community can obtain a test whenever they wish. Some selected populations, such as student athletes, also test more regularly. The DC Department of Health has continued to require mask wearing in educational institutions. We are in frequent contact with our colleagues at the DC Department of Health, and we're tracking this issue very closely. In my conversation with Dr. Mishori, I'll ask her to provide some context on current mask guidelines here in our city and on the guidelines announced recently by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Let's now bring in Renit to provide some reflections on our current moment. Renit, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to engage your insights as our Chief Public Health Officer on some of the recent developments we've seen in the response to COVID-19. There are four key issues I wish to focus on. Isolation, trends in DC, the new mask guidance from CDC and DC Health, and antiviral treatments. Let's start with the current guidance on isolation. A month ago, the DC Department of Health announced new isolation protocols. Immediately following this guidance, we updated our community's plans for isolation. Rene, now that we have had this policy in place for the past month, can you talk about what we are seeing when it comes to isolation? Yes, uh, thanks, Jack, and it's so good to be here as usual. Um, so I think what we were seeing, um, we're right at the tail end of the tsunami, uh, the Omicron tsunami, and we have had a higher than usual number, an absolute number of cases and a higher case rate than, uh, than before Omicron. But certainly the numbers are going down very, very nicely and pretty rapidly. So the, the, the change in isolation policy was a very, very welcome change uh, because we were seeing so many cases, but also because of the, the burden, the mental health burden on those in isolation. Um, of course, the, the new guidelines for us are a little bit more restrictive than the CDC guidelines because we recommend and require actually an antigen test on day five 
And so um, that has been slightly different. We did not know quite what to expect um, when we instituted those guidelines. The, the research was not really there. There are very few studies um, to help us kind of gauge what, what would be happening. But I can tell you that now about a month into this, um, we are seeing that uh, a, a substantial number of people, maybe around 40% of people who are uh, testing positive on day five, and while this can be quite disappointing for, for a lot of people, um, from a safety perspective, from a public health perspective, it's actually reassuring to us that we are catching these people, that we're keeping them um, in isolation and separated from those in the community that they can potentially infect. Are the cases we see generally symptomatic or asymptomatic? What is the breakdown? I would say that about 80 to 85% of people are symptomatic. And by symptomatic, I mean mild to moderate. And that's a lot of it is in the eye of the beholder, but we're talking about sore throat, fever, chills, headaches, those kinds of symptoms. And some people, for some people, it's a little bit more disabling uh, for a few days and for some a uh, little less, but we're definitely seeing a majority of people who are um, symptomatic. And as you just shared with us at the five day mark, when we do test people, we are finding that about 40% of those who have been in isolation for five days, their test, they, they continue to test positive. Correct. And that is aligned with very recent uh, studies that have come out literally last week. But we feel like we're always a little bit ahead of the research here because we're implementing new policies that are completely new that nobody's tried before. Um, so it's reassuring to know that we're not some freak of nature here and that our rates are similar to uh, what is being seen in other settings, other universities and other parts of the country. Let's turn to the overall context here in our region. We have now moved to a case rate of under 200 cases per 100,000 in the past seven days. We have an image here of what the trends in DC look like. Why is this important? How would you characterize the current situation in DC? So first of all, it is incredibly um, wonderful that the numbers have gone down to pre-Omicron uh, days, pre-Omicron numbers. The Omicron um, surge was just something that was unimaginable in the past, un unimaginable in the past. But the, the rate of 200 per 100,000 population is, is really significant because this is sort of the new magic number that the CDC, the new benchmark that the CDC has designated to help us, to help uh, communities and municipalities determine whether the community is considered to have low, medium, or high level community transmission. Um, what's interesting is that that number, the 200 over 100,000 population, used to signify in the pre-Omicron days, it used to signify substantial community transmission. And now it is being considered as the indicator below which we are, everything is okay. It's, it's a, the rates are described as low. So, so in a way, the, what the CDC was doing is that by raising that number, they were lowering the bar. In a way, I, I think it would say, I, I, would, I would characterize it as, as suggesting that we as a, as a country or as a city, that we're willing to tolerate much higher absolute number of absolute numbers of cases and absolute and, and case rates uh, in the community before we kick in some public health measures into into gear. Maybe this is the 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 legacy of the Omicron surge because the numbers were so astronomically high and so unimaginable that that the fact that we survived it and if anything less seems uh, manageable at this point. Sure, sure. But let's turn to the guidance on the use of masks by the DC Health Department and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Both have recently announced new guidance on this issue. Yes, so um, this is a very complicated uh, situation because the CDC trailed a lot of states in, uh, in issuing the new guidelines. Um, the new guidelines basically talk about um, new, there, there are new indicators that they put in place that uh, are based on 
the rate of the people in the community who are infected. This is the famous 200 um, per 100,000 in the previous week. And they added two additional indicators um, to that. One is the hospitalization number in the previous week from people with and from COVID. And then one is the percent of beds that are occupied uh, in, in the community, which is an indicator of the, the ability of the healthcare system to, to care for people with COVID. So you kind of mix and match these, these three indicators uh, and that gives you a sense of how your community is doing. So low um, is, is green and medium is, or is yellow and, and high is orange. And then you have to basically look at the numbers in your community. And if your community is in the green zone, then you are allowed to toss the mask away and uh, go about your business and you don't have to wear a mask indoors. Of course, this is about individuals. This is not necessarily about certain settings. And the CDC is very specific and stating that the guidelines are not binding to cities or, or uh, situations or businesses. And that means that cities and states and, and institutions, um, even in the areas where you are in the green zone in the low risk area, you can set your own rules depending on um, your specific circumstances. So, um, so that while the new recommendations um, may apply to individuals in the community in settings where there's higher transmission, even in a community that is green, you may need to or you may uh, be asked to implement some additional public health measures, such as resuming indoor um, masking. And and how how does the CDC guidance connect to DC Health? Is DC Health in the same place? What kind of guidance, for example, is DC Health setting for us on mask wearing? So DC, um, the mayor has announced the new um, masking guidelines uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and in essence, what she's saying is in certain settings, certain circumstances, you can take the mask off in indoor settings. But she did specify a few situations, a few congregate settings where she um, has said that masking should remain in effect until further notice. And um, one of them is universities and schools, others are prisons and other congregate settings. So for the time being, we are uh, waiting to see whether she's going to change those guidelines in the near future. So we're um, very much closely monitoring uh, any messaging from the um, from the DC government and the Department of Health, and we'll try to adjust our masking um, uh, uh, guidelines based on what they say and based on the situation on campus and the rates uh, and the number of cases and the rates of cases that we have on campus. So all schools and universities remain under a requirement by DC Health to continue masking indoors. Correct. Um, and, and this is because these, the universities and schools are considered congregate settings where the risk of transmission is higher, usually, and the risk is higher than the general community uh, surrounding it. Another aspect of our response to COVID-19 has been the availability of vaccines and medical treatments. In these early months of 2022, we're seeing increased availability of antiviral treatments for COVID-19, such as Pfizer's oral pill, Paxlovid, what do you see as the possible impact of the antiviral treatments? Does this help us to reach a turning point? I think those antivirals are a really, really promising layer um, in the Swiss cheese model uh, that we know so well. Um, but I think it's going to be a little while before it's available to all of those who can benefit from it. Um, as, as you know, the uh, President Biden the other day promised in his State of the Union address that he would make available these free antivirals to anyone who tests positive in a community-based pharmacy. Um, and so um, I don't know how long before this can be operationalized. Uh, it certainly is becoming more readily available by prescription in the community, but it's still not very widely used because there are supply issues. And so at the moment, it is really only reserved for people at high risk. Um, those who are um, older individuals, those with serious pre-existing conditions or comorbid conditions, uh, and some of the younger people who have multiple risk factors such as obesity or hypertension or more than one comorbid um, diseases in the, as their background um, medical history. So I think it's gonna be a little while, but it's certainly a very, very promising prospect in the fight against COVID. And do we have a sense yet as to the impact 
of the antiviral treatments on then the time for isolation? At this point, we don't know. Again, this is so early and the people are just beginning to study the impact on individuals and communities. Um, I, we know that for individuals at high risk, it works very well, but it's un, um, we, we don't know yet whether it's going to contribute to reducing uh, isolation or eliminating it altogether. Got it. Got it. Rene, thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights on this range of issues today. We are so grateful for your leadership and your commitment to our community as we continue our response to COVID-19. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate being here and thank you for your support of all of our COVID uh, response policies and protocols. Wish you the very best. Thank you. Thank you all for joining me today. I look forward to being together with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you. For every Hoya, everywhere.